welcome everyone back to the unnormalized podcast this is your host frankie a and i'm really excited about today's guest um today we have baron raymondi who is a professional saxophone player um we've met through um some mutual connections and as many of you know the premise of the show is to speak to people who are living life unnormalized outside of what the norm is supposed to do with life so um everybody baron for many of you who don't know um i do a lot of research on the guests that i asked to come on um and baron is a phenomenal saxophonist um the work his body of work is impressive uh and i thought he would be a great guest to come on just to um music is my thing i love music in all its forms and it's like air to me so it was a no-brainer to try to reach out to baron and see if i can get him to come on and just tell us a little bit about um life as a saxophone player um how he got into music and things of that nature so um baron how did you you know growing up sometimes we have these ideas and dreams um and we kind of leave them at that and we don't follow through with those dreams how did music kind of start coming about into your life what would you you come from like a musical background or tell us a little bit about how you got you know a little bit about baron tell us where you've come from where where you where you you've started your journey okay um I, I do come from a musical family my father played violin uh and my mother sang opera um and uh my father's uncle played violin with the NBC orchestra under Toscanini okay and um he he was uh he lived with them for a while so uh my he he was my great uncle's favorite student uh so m- actually my my uh, parents named me Baron, B-A-R-O-N, because they thought it'd be a good show name. So they, they <laughs> but they, they wanted me to be a classical musician. Sure. They started me on classical piano. And um, when I was uh, six years old, my father brought me to a lady in Carnegie Hall Studios. Carnegie Hall has studios upstairs uh, from the the, the uh, concert hall that they have places where people teach lessons and. Uh, uh, a lot of famous people have lived up there, Marlon Brando. But, nice. Uh, Dean Crane, the very famous ba- ballet teacher who my sister studied with up there, had a uh, studio up there. And I studied with this lady uh, from uh, Italy called Dr. Emily DiTerzo. And uh, she took me on as a student. And um, she really, uh, she thought, she wanted me to be a classical pianist too. Her uh, aunt that lived up there, she also lived in the studio. She had a... Uh, a uh, studio with pianos. Uh, a uh, the room I used to take lessons in were uh, was with a big pipe organ that she inherited from the uh, the the organist from St. Patrick's Cathedral. Oh, nice. But, yeah, it was featured in Life magazine a number of years ago. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, and um, her aunt who knew Toscanini said, "Push this kid, Baron, because he has potential to be a great musician." Uh, so I was I was. I was I was kind of pushed into the classical thing, okay. which I did like, um, and I I did competitions and I did well. And my father, at the age of eight, used to bring me down right down the street on 57th Street, down the street from Cardi Hall. There was a horn and hardest, and there was a piano in there, and he used to put me on stage and play. Nice. Uh, which I used to get nervous about, but I think he was trying to help me get over the stage fright and all that at a young kid. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but uh, but anyway, so I was encouraged with the classical music, and um, which I I liked. But I kind of what, what we moved at. I was living in New York City at the time, and then we moved up to Westchester County to Scarsdale, and I felt a little more isolated with the playing the piano. Um, and they offered the uh, saxophone and band. And okay. My best friend. Um, he uh, he signed up to play saxophone. I actually signed up for French horn, but I saw he signed up, and we were like very close friends. And I decided to pick up the saxophone in the band in school, and I really enjoyed playing with other people. So that's kind of how I got into the saxophone. But my parents didn't really like that so much because uh, 
they were classical musicians and there wasn't really not, they thought saxophone was kind of jazz oriented and, uh, you know, there's not much uh, music for classical saxophone except Berlioz. A couple of composers had uh, written music for saxophone. So they were kind of, like, they thought it was nice that I played in the band. Like they, something to something to do, like, you know, as, uh, as like, almost like a hobby. Yeah, yeah, they didn't think it was serious, you know? They didn't consider it serious, yeah. And it's funny and it's funny that you say that, because even though you were brought up with music surrounding you, and, you know, that was where your your family your, wanted to kind of get you into that, where most people who are have some sort of talent like that. Um, the family is not really encouraging because they kind of think it's like a pipe dream or whatever. Um, but even what what I find when I talk to people doing this podcast, Baron, is that um, there's like a common thread between all of us who have done things outside of what the plan was made for us, even though you were in the environment to be classically, a classically trained musician, you still kind of went off the beaten path um, and went the way of a non-traditional, non-classical um, musician. Um, and that's kind of what, you know, you hit on basically the premise of this whole show is just talking to people and, you know, um, who have something in them that is kind of like an innate thing that tells them, you know, I have this passion, I have this desire, I have this skill, this dream, and I need to do something with it. Um, so it's it's interesting for me to hear that even though you were classically trained, that you still went the route of going, you know, just through the normal school band um, and picking up something that you really had a passion to learn how to play and and to see where it's kind of taking you is is amazing because i could be sitting here talking to baron who's a classically trained and and pianist um but i'm talking to you as a saxophone player so um that's that's totally impressive um so so you started out in well you you got your 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 niche with the saxophone in you said it was in high school right in elementary school, I was elementary in school, fourth grade, yeah, and I had a really good uh, band director, Mr. Costelli, and uh, he was very kind and very nurturing, which I liked because the classical, I was, I was kind of pushed very hard, like really pushed, and the, I, I mean, had my father used to have me get up in the morning before school and s- practice and make, sure I had to sign a practice pad whenever I practiced to keep logs in my practice and then after school he wanted me to practice and sign the log and if i didn't sign that log it was all hell yeah, <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, yeah. it was it was like uh your record keeping for them <laughs> yes yes they kept logs in my practice for me yes they wanted me to sign i had to sign it every time i practiced saxophone they didn't care about they, <laughs> yeah, they it was, it was, yes um so like talk to me like okay as a young child, how like grueling is, um, I, cause I can only imagine how much, um, time and effort and practice that you have to be in, uh, to put in with any type of instrument, um, that you play. So like, what was like your typical day? Like how many hours did you put in, um, as a young guy, um, and basically, in, in whether it be in the piano or learning saxophone, like how many, how much time does one put into like developing that craft? Well, I, I mean, I was, I was practicing at least forty-five to an hour on piano at a very young age, mm-hmm. especially because I had to learn uh, fifteen pieces for a competition and memorize them all. So there was a lot of time involved. Um, saxophone, I did it more for fun. I. I learned the music at school, which wasn't that hard. So I didn't put as much time, but I loved playing it. So I played a lot more than practice. It wasn't until I went to music school at University of North Texas where I realized that I need to practice like four to six hours a day to get really good at my instrument. Yeah. So, but I, it wasn't really till I got to music school that I started practicing my uh, saxophone beyond an hour a day. or And there it was... Uh, like four to six hours a day. Yes. 
So yeah, it's it's a lot of a lot of work that you put into developing your craft. I'll tell you a funny story. Um, I some years back um, went to a um, you may have heard of it, Sacred Heart Cathedral in North Newark. It's the big cathedral that they have in in Newark. Um, went there, fell in love with the church, fell in love with um, the choir that they had there. And I've always sang in um, high school and choirs, nothing professionally, just, you know, for fun and stuff. Um, And figured, you know, I was at a point in my life where, you know, I wanted to try different things that I normally haven't tried before. And um, reached out to the choir director there and said, hey, you know, like, what do you have to do to become part of the choir? So he says, you know, come on in for an audition and you know we'll see where it goes you would have thought that at that point i would have said well this guy is asking me to come in for an audition maybe it's something beyond just like a normal choir but didn't think about it um go sing for him audition he says hey come be part of the choir i go to the first choir practice and they hand me a music book and i guess he automatically thought that i knew how to read music which i didn't um and as we're going through the practice, um, I'm finding uh, like these singers are like really badass, like, I mean, operatic singers, uh, jazz singers, like all kind, like the voices were phenomenal. And we take a break and I'm talking to the, I was in um, the bass section and um, I'm talking to the, the guy next to me and um, we're just like trying to kind of chit chatting and getting to know each other. And he's telling me like, all of this, these great accomplishments that he's saying in Broadway and um, all kinds of stuff in operas. And he went to school at um, a college that was just basically for um, choir singing. And I, unbeknownst to me, I was the only person in that entire choir that was not a professional singer on some level. I mean, we're talking about when I went and looked at who these people were, they actually did substantial amount of work in, you know, in singing for the Vatican and all that kind of stuff. So I was, I could understand like how much goes into that because I had to like learn like the cliff notes way to kind of catch up to them. So I know just from speaking to people who make this their profession how much time and effort and um blood sweat and tears that they put into the craft just like any other profession that you would you know some people think that it comes easy but um when you're at your level of of talent skills and uh professionalism with the craft um it's something that you really have to dedicate your you know your your time and your life to So, um, you know, I just wanted to take that second just to, you know, as a layman who doesn't have any experience with anything like that. um, I just recently picked up the ukulele um, and just to play around with. I'm doing like just some online kind of stuff like that because of my time schedule. But, um, you know, I can just with that little tiny piece of it um, that could be challenging. I can't even imagine what it would be to be someone that young um, and to put that amount of time and effort into it. Um, It takes a lot of discipline. So I definitely commend you on being a young guy and, and putting forth where, you know, the other kids are going out and playing around and jerking off and doing all kinds of other things. Baron's in there kind of honing his craft. So um, what now, when you you say that you kind of were going the saxophone route um since your family was so you know they had in their mind that baron was going to go more of like a classical route um how did they kind of take to that my father didn't take very well to it because he really wanted me to be a classical pianist it was like his dream Mm -hmm. because he felt like he didn't pursue his violin as much as he could uh, some for some family, I think his mom was ill when he was young and he had to take care of his mom. So he really didn't get to pursue it like he wanted to, like his uncle did playing mm-hmm. Ginny and all that. So uh, he he 
he didn't take me seriously playing saxophone. Uh, he, but he did. Um, he wouldn't get me lessons because he didn't want to pay for lessons for me because he didn't think it was serious. Mm. Uh, but he did. He did send me to some music camps in the summer, which was really good. And I met, actually, I met some people that I still play with today when I was 12 years old. Oh wow! Yeah, my friend Cliff Line, who plays with Average White, the Average White Band now. I've known Cliff since I was 12 years old. And we such got, a great band. Such a great band. Yeah, and we uh, went to uh, North Texas State University together. He was there uh, for a little while when I went down to University of North Texas, which is a great jazz school. I don't know if you know about it. but uh, I've, heard, I've heard of it. I've heard of it. And, and they also have a good choral department, but a lot of famous musicians went there, including Noah Jones and Don Henley went there. But apparently he failed out, so uh, <laughs> it's in a no. doc about the Eagles. But um, um, but uh, he, I think he saw that I was serious, and uh, and then he turned me on to like Charlie Parker and Paul Desmond. He gave me some records like "Listen to This," like if you really want to be serious about this, listen mm. to these guys. And I did. And my mother was friends with. Uh, her friend was uh, accounted for Stan Getz and Dizzy Gillespie, and they brought me to this show, uh, this concert for a kid uh, up in Terrytown, New York, that had got hit by lightning. And uh, they got a second row seats for uh, the concert, and I saw Duke Ellington, which wow. changed, changed my life. I was like 11 or 12 years old, and I, I knew when I saw the sax section and the sax player, I think it was Paul Gonzalez, and... Um, come out and play to the audience, I said, this is what I want to do. Um, and um, and when I saw Stan Getz, I bought his records immediately and said, this is what I want to do. But they they really didn't take it that seriously, you know, because mm. it wasn't classical music. So it was a kind of a fight. It was like, uh, it, it was almost a rebellious thing that I picked God. up. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, yes. You know, I like, can I can yeah. I can I can totally get that because um, um, I was discussing with um, another guest uh, that I had on and we were talking about kind of the same topic about being kids and um, coming up and knowing and and that moment where you kind of know like you have a there you have something there um, I actually. Um, my parents wanted me to go to school to become a writer um, and um, had some great offers to go to school to be a writer. Um, but I always danced um, hip hop for many, many years, just like kind of like how you, you, you were saying about the saxophone, just kind of like, you know, at parties and special events and things like that. I joined a couple of talent shows and won some stuff. But, you know, even at that point, part i didn't really know that i had something there i mean it's not every day you see a white boy that dances hip-hop so um you know i grew up in 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 newark so it was just the culture that i was surrounded by but um as i kind of got into like high school and started really doing some stuff with it um i got offered a um some gigs doing some stuff off Broadway. And when I mentioned it to the parents, they were like, absolutely not. You're going to school to become a writer, um, all that kind of stuff. And that's a big reason why I do this show is because I kind of followed the beaten path. Um, I did stuff all along my career choices in hip hop, doing community stuff. Uh, weddings and all kinds of different things. I was on MTV a couple of times, but nothing to the level that uh, a professional would do. Um, and it is something, to be honest with you, Baron, something that I always think about, um, even at I'll be 43 next week, thinking about if I would have maybe had the courage and the strength at that time, like I do now, to say, no, this is what I'm going to do and follow that path, where would it lead me? But then I also think about, I did have some great experiences. I've done a lot of work with like more with youth. So teaching kids how to dance, um, doing choreography for them, um, you know, and, and shows and group numbers and all that kind of stuff. So where it, it did fill, it did fill a place in my heart and, and dances, something that 
always will be part of me. And when I think you said you went to go see Dizzy Gillespie for the first time, is that where you said that you got kind of like really uh, got Duke Ellington? Duke Ellington had Dizzy Gillespie and Stan Getz. And the, I I was blown away by it, you know. And, and uh, yeah, that uh, similar experience like that happened to me. I used to work for New Jersey Performing Arts Center, and the first time I got to see the Alvin Ailey Dance Company was like, and Twyla Tharp opening my world to all that is choreography um, at its best was something that I can't explain. It was like I felt like I was home when I was in the midst of all that. Um, like I had found that connection with people who can identify the power of, you know, something like the performing arts and dance and music. So um, I, I, I it's it's great that you took the other route um, because we wouldn't have your all your experiences and, and um, your musical gifts if you didn't go that route. So tell us a little bit about. Um, you have an ex- an, a very impressive, extensive resume. Um, tell us about some of the people that you've played with over your 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 time as a saxophone player. Um, well, I've played with a lot of people because I freelance, mm-hmm. and to this day, like you were talking about learning, I'm constantly learning. Like I'm doing this, uh, playing with this Rod Stewart impersonator, Rick. Uh, Lair more uh, Thursday night, so I'm working on his music. Ironically, I did play with Rod Stewart. I toured with him on the Human Tour, uh, which was uh, it was accidental because uh, um, he was looking for a blonde female. <laughs> and what what happened was my friend Chuck Kentis, who lived in Nutley, New Jersey at the time, uh, where and I met Chuck. I lived I live in Nutley. Mm-hmm. Uh, I used to go to his. He was playing with Rod. And I used to go to his house to record music for him. And uh, I, Rod used to come to New York to do TV shows. And sometimes Chuck would ask me, do you know any background singers or maybe a percussionist? Or, you know, they would ask, you know, for extra things. And they asked for a horn section um, for this uh, 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 benefit for uh, the City of Hope Church, I think it was called. And I they asked me to get a horn section and I put the horn section together for them and then they called me back and said there's not enough room on the stage but then they said can you play saxophone uh, on some guys have all the luck which was oh. famous for this for this benefit and before I I um, they came to New York I, they had me go out to dinner with, with Rod just to meet him and whatever I had met him before because I had gotten musicians for some of his other shows and um, and singers, he said, uh, "Do you know any blonde saxophone players?" And I said, "Well, I'll think about it." You know, and he goes, "Welcome to the orchestra." You know, playing with us. And I I thought I was just gonna you know play this benefit, play one solo. And then when I got to rehearsal the next day, they had me play all these other songs. They were they had all these other Brandy and Jewel. Uh, I guess at the benefit they were gonna surprise Rod at the end, and they recorded me. Um, they recorded the rehearsal and they really liked, Rod wasn't there and they really liked how he played and when I got to the rehearsal the day Rod was there, they they had me play this ballad with Brandy in front of Rod and he came over to me and said, I want you and I was like, do you I'm blonde and blue eyes. I thought he was just joking, you know. Because, <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, serious. And he asked, me, he asked me to play on Rosie O'Donnell tonight's the night, the sax solo, the famous sax solo on there and um, I had to renegotiate the money and it played in LA. And when I called up, they said, uh, you know, we want, Rod wants you. How much money do you want? And I was like, really? And uh, so I ended up playing with Rod, which was really fantastic. Um, he used to feature me a lot. I had many solos each night, like six or seven. And I used to play a um, solo on Downtown Train, the song where he did a wardrobe change. And it's mm-hmm. on YouTube. Uh, downturn trade i have it on my website that i would take a six minute solo which is a very long solo to play in front of arenas every night which was amazing experience at a school that i didn't get in school yeah you have to keep twenty thousand people you know excited you know for for six minutes which was amazing um but some uh so rod was great 
I got to play with Levon Helm. You know mm-hmm. Levon? Yes. I, I played with him. I played. I uh, got invited to play with him at the Ramble in Woodstock, and then I did a little run with him down in um, the Wolf's Trap in Virginia in the Keswick Theater. He was great. I did the Broadway show Ain't Nothing But the Blues, which was cool. Uh, uh, on, uh, and the Love Janice, uh, the, the Broadway show about Love Janice. I've and, actually seen that twice. My wife is a huge Janice Joplin fan, so I probably was there in the audience when you were playing. Um, probably. It, it was, I actually, I, what happened was I got the gig. I auditioned for Love Janice. And okay. Then, I got the gig with Rod. The, like everything was all hitting at once. I got the gig with Rod right after that, so I had to give up the the show. But then when I came off tour with Rod, they let me. Su- I played like sixty shows. But uh, what uh, a great show! That was such a great, great, great show and a great yeah. homage yeah. to her. Uh, loved it, loved it. That was a lot of fun. But the guy that really mentored me on the road when I got out of college, I went to North Texas State University. I like. When my, we're talking about my, what my parents wanted me to do, they wanted me, if I was going to go into music, at least get into education or have that as a fallback or whatever. So I was a music, jazz studies and a music ed major, but it kind of, I kind of swayed away from that. And uh, they offered me a scholarship for a master's degree in jazz. I was the mm. first one to get that. So I kind of swayed away from that. And I went, I, when I was at a co- right out of college, pretty much, this guy from the Blues Brothers, Matt Guitar Murphy, mm-hmm. uh, who played with all the great blues guys, asked me to go on the road with him. And I, all of a sudden I found myself on the road, um, which my parents didn't really like. They, they thought maybe they wanted me to teach, but I ended up like traveling with Matt and he was like a mentor and he brought me everywhere. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the, my first tour was like 11 and a half weeks on the road with him. And yeah, was, lo- that yeah. must... That that ha- I mean I could see as a parent how like that would be concerning but what an awesome like I mean as a musician there's no better I mean I would I would guess I I, I have no idea but I, I for like I said I have a love of music and for a musician I would think the road life is where you get the the most experience not only touring I mean like I go to concerts a hell of a lot of concerts I've been to probably over no lie easy six seven hundred concerts from bruce to tina turner to rage against the machine so i i see like to play on stage um while there's a dress change for six minutes and i've watched your youtube videos um you blow like i have never seen before um and i i think that's I've always thought the saxophone was like a badass instrument because it's like one of the only instruments, in my opinion, that like you're like really breathing in your heart and soul. And um, the amount of stamina it must take to stay on stage in a large arena for six minutes, um, that's impressive shit. And uh, I, you know... I guess that was, you know, for us as people who are the recipients of your work, getting into, you know, more of the on the road type of stuff, um, we get to re- we got to reap the benefits of it. If you were sitting in a classroom somewhere, yeah, those students are going to get the, the benefit of, of Baron. But, you know, you're now with all that work that you've done, we get to it gets put out there for, you know, mass consumption for music lovers to um, appreciate, you know, a gift like you have. And um, I I, I was thoroughly impressed with, um, you know, some of the stuff that you had on on your YouTube page and on your, um, um, your website. And so what, so you played with Rod, you played, um, did some um, Broadway stuff, um, what else did you, what else have you, have you kind of, I know I saw in your bio something about like you did um, some work for like the Ricky Lake show. Yeah, I uh, wrote some music with Chuck Kansas who played keys who, with Rod Stewart. We wrote some music for that, but it kind of, it went off the air pretty 
quick. Unfortunately, I got my first royalties and whatever, and I was like, oh, this is great. And then she went off the air, so that yeah. was, <laughs> it was cool. It was cool. I, you know, the, uh, we had music on the show. That was very cool. But getting back to Matt, you were talking about the stem, stamina and mm-hmm. all that. Matt, we used to play six or seven nights a week on the road with Matt. And he, this guy used to play a blues. He could play a solo for 13 minutes without stopping. And he wanted 110% every night, no matter how you felt or whatever. And I think that's part of the reason that I had gotten strength like that to play a solo like that in front of Arena with Rod. Plus, you know, a lot of those English guys like those blues guys, you know, their, their style and got a lot of stuff from them. And I had that style that Rod wanted, you know, that's when he heard me play. It was like I've been I had spent so much time in the road with Matt that um, I, I think he liked that. I, I had that R&B influence. But um, yeah. So but uh, who else? I recently played with Little Steven I, uh, and the, uh, the Disciples of Soul in Milan. I, oh, cool. I, I was asked to fill in um, for Stan Harrison. His daughter was graduating high school and I filled in. But that was that was it was great. It was I played. Uh, I only did one show, but I had to learn the whole show for one concert on the tour. So that was a a, a lot to learn for one show. But talk I talk about talk about pressure. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had to even go with the choreographer. There was all you know. Uh, I played flute on Little Steven's microphone, a big solo on there. You know, and, um, you know, solos that were, for, you know, verbatim from the record that he just put out, Summer Sorcery. You know, I had to learn all that. Um, I've been, I played recently with Gloria Gaynor. Yeah, uh, I did see, I did see that. How, I, what an, what an amazing, uh, what an amazing experience that must have been. Right. Yes. So, um, who, uh, uh Levon Helm, um, who else, I, I did a, a thing with Joan Jett a couple of years ago, a tribute to her, and I got to back up a lot of people from that um, and play with Joan Jett and Cheap Trick. And, oh, that's 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 badass. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, a couple of years ago, yeah, you know, Springsteen plays the, sometimes does the Light of Day show. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, La Bamba from La Bamba and the Hubcaps, and uh, uh, he asked me to do his big band, and Bruce came on stage with us there so i was able to back up bruce which was a lot of fun that that is like bruce is like like the he's the first concert that i went to is was was bruce when he came and did the born in the usa tour like back in like 85 86 and so that was my first my mom is a huge 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 bruce springsteen fan so we went to like um it was that giant stadium i'm dating myself calling it a giant stadium um i mean not giant stadium yeah giant stadium and um we didn't even have tickets my mom was just like let's go and listen in the parking lot i think we had tickets for like one night the last show and uh my mom sees this guy coming out of like the side handing some groupie chicks tickets and my mom goes up to him and is like i see you giving tickets away you have to give me tickets he's like i'm not giving you tickets she's like yeah you got to give me tickets she pestered this guy so much that he just wind up giving my mom like four tickets to go inside we did that every night for like a week straight (laughs) and the cool thing about his concert back then is that you know concerts usually end about like 11 11 15 ish 11 30 ish at a quarter to 11 they would open up the gates and let everybody into giant stadium so they can hear like the last five ten minutes of the show so um i am a super huge bruce fan so to hear that you've played behind him that that's like you're making my you're you're rocking my world right now and it's such it's it's so like amazing to me that um because you probably could have had this just as much of a fruitful career in classical music than you have in uh r&b and jazz and rock and all the stuff that you have played um 
but following that that passion um, because you are a very soulful R&B your whole vibe when you, when I watch you play on YouTube and stuff and watching your videos it's it's very soulful very R&B so like to know that background um, and I guess that's probably why you are so good because you are classically trained but it's it's so impressive Baron to to see you know you could tell when you know you have the love for it um, and, and it, it kind of exudes when you're on stage, you're like getting into it, you're jamming, you know, you had me jamming while I was watching it. I actually was, had it, um, watched it and then was listening it to in my car, um, and just jamming out. Like it was, it was a really good time and that's what people want to experience. And that's why you can stay on stage for six minutes and entertain a crowd of 20,000 people. Um, you know, because you exude that and, you know, you, you, you're sucking people into it. Um, and I felt that just sitting in my car, you know? Um, so what is that like? Talk to me about what it's like. Um, cause that's not, that's an unnormalized experience getting on a stage in a stadium in front of 20, 25,000 people. What is that like? Um, it's it can be surreal in a way sometimes. Um, I mean it's not it's not as intimate like in a club. I like playing in clubs because it's very intimate. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes it's almost like the real. Uh, I mean the energy is pretty incredible, uh, especially when the people are roaring for you. You know at the end of a solo, it's like a lot of energy. And you were talking about energy too. Was like. I have such a passion for music that, you know, people say, how do you have so much energy? And it's just my passion. And I love to see the joy. And basically I'm just giving my feelings. My life is on my, my feelings and my, my experiences in life. I'm, I'm bringing out there. It's almost a visual thing uh, for me. It's, it's pretty incredible to play in front of that many people. I mean, one time on that downtown train solo, at a, I think it was in Tampa at some marina, and after the solo, they were chanting my name, and I, I just started crying. It was like, oh my god! I wish you know my mom had passed. I wish my mom was here. You know what I mean? Like yeah, it was one of those those moments where like you kind of were like, <laughs> like I've made it. Like this is <laughs> yeah. I'm at a stadium and they're they're chanting my name. Like I mean that's what my whole life for you know this is yeah. What I, this is what I worked in practice and, you know, I worked for this my whole life and here it is, you know, I have a lot of gratitude for that. Yes. And and you can tell, you can tell, I mean, like, uh, you know, just from the people that have, you know, wanted you to be part of their projects. Um, You're talking about names like Rod Stewart and stuff like that. And, and, um, people who get the best of the best, you know what I mean? And um, they don't mess around when it comes to stuff like that. So, you know, um, I can see, I can see the, the why people are drawn into you um, because you can tell you put everything in it. Um, I would say to people who are listening, go to, um, Baron Ramondi, and your your YouTube channel is is your first and last name, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so go to saxbaron.com. Um, I'm gonna post some links in 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 the the podcast with it broadcast um, to all Baron's um, outlets, but visually to watch him play, um, subscribe to his YouTube channel. Um, there's some awesome stuff and you will see how hard and how much this guy puts into every song he plays. I mean, I, I don't know where you were, but, um, I was totally digging. You were playing with a female. She had a like black dress on and she stopped. She was the singer and she stopped singing. She gets out 
while you're playing your your solo, she gets into the audience and starts dancing. You come off the stage with your sax and you're dancing with her while you're playing in the sax. I mean, I, I was like, that's that's awesome. Uh, you know, and you can see that you totally put 100 percent of it. Also, not only the hard work, but you can see the joy that comes out of you um, when you're playing. And that's something, as a social worker, I work in uh, behavior and mental health. And we try to, when we work with people who are having a rough go around and um, not feeling like they have things that they can tap into, we call them, in my line of work, uh, wellness tools. Um, and we always aim to find something that people can put their passion, their love, um, you know, no judgment, no, you know, who get, kind of like a, almost who gives a shit type of, of thing that they can tap into as an outlet. Um, and you can see that that's your music and your craft is something that not only that you work hard at, that you get this joy and passion from. It, it, it's it's a great thing to to bear witness to. It, is is it kind of almost like a sense of like an outlet for for a lot of things for you, Baron? It has been an outlet. It definitely can be a healer for me. Uh, yeah, I mean. Um, my sister just went through brain surgery. When I play, it's I can express that through there. You know the uh, my emotions. Yes, I it's a, a it's an expression of what I, you know. Yes, it's an outlet for sure. Definitely. definitely. And and I and 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 talk about the you must be exhausted after you play when you're going hard like that. I mean. I, I I can only imagine like that's when after I was watching your videos I'm like and and he's going in for another like another song or he has a full concert that he has to play at every song it's like you're giving it 100 you could tell you were trained to give it 110 percent because um, you you it, 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 it's it's looks physically exhausting like how do you, how do you, is there things that you do to prepare for like when you're or is it just something that you, when you get on the stage wherever you are whether it be a big stadium or a small intimate setting that once you get on there it kind of like kicks into like overdrive and and you're you're on automatic and you're just kind of like you know going through as it comes along emotions and and feelings and energy um, is it something that you have to prepare for like the stamina for it I think it is, yes. And part of it is playing every day. I try to practice and keep, you know, my chops up on my instrument. Because if I don't practice, then my chops will go down, and then it's going to be harder to do that, especially the older you get. Sure, um, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I got to. I, I try to play every day. I, um, you know, I do teach students. I tell them, you know, uh, you got to play every day. You got to play. You got to, you know, practice. Uh, Every day, um, I I pretty I learned this from Macatar Murphy because he gave 110 percent on the road every night, and I I had to play next to this man for 11 years straight with this, and he expected nothing but that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and and um and uh, he loved me for that because I did that for him. If you didn't do that for him, you were pretty much gone. Yeah, you know? sure. He didn't expect, you know. He didn't, he didn't want somebody up there not doing that. Um, um, yeah, sometimes I like try to relax before I play or just be calm, maybe breathe, maybe uh, uh, do some stretches, like, you know, a warm ups. I have to do warm up for that. I can't just let it out right away. I, have, I do these long tones on the instrument and do some warm ups with my throat. I do do warm ups. It's just like an athlete. You, you I as you were saying it, I, I was. Yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking about is how like an athlete has to warm up, you yeah. know, before like whatever sport that they're going to to play. Because I mean, I mean, you guys have to go on to his his 
I can't tell you enough to, to go check out his YouTube because of the the amount of energy that comes out of one person. It's it's amazing. Um, and it looks very, very intense, um, strenuous. Um, so I can see how you do need to, you know, prepare yourself just like an athlete. You know, a uh, 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 athlete doesn't sometimes they're, they don't go as long as you do. <laughs> you probably go. You, you can hurt yourself if you don't do that. You can yeah. really, you know, I have to be careful with my hands not being too tight or, you know, holding things too tight because uh, I, I can hurt myself. You know, I, I, I felt pain in my fingers. I felt, you know, my throat hurting some, you know, I've my lip getting a bit, you know, getting a scar there. I have to be very careful uh, I have to I have to stay loose when I do it. Yeah. You know, I think when I was younger, I didn't realize as much. But also I had a lot, you know, I was a lot stronger when I was younger physically. Uh, I'm I'm still a strong person. I'm a strong person in general. Yeah. I, I'm a strong, I have a lot of, I, I walk, I can walk along, I walk a lot. I, I, I have a lot of stamina in my, I, I'm, I, I don't know. Maybe that's uh, some. It's just a gift I have. I I, I have. I, I can uh, I can do things for marathon pace. You know. So, yeah. And and yes. and and thank God because if you did it, I mean, you wouldn't have been able to sustain the career that you you had. You would have went back to classical music. You know. But um, what a gift you have. And I I I, I no bullshit. Um, I, I, I'm not saying that just because okay. I have you, have you on that podcast. Um, I work I, hard at it. I work hard at it. And you can tell, and you can tell, I can, I, I, I can testify to what it's like to, um, you know, mine isn't necessarily while music and, and performing arts and all that kind of stuff is a passion of mine. Um, my life's work is in a different area it's in in this more of the um service kind of to you know people which you do the same i mean what you know what people can get out of your your craft is just as therapeutic as what they get out of my craft but i can tell you when you have a passion and a love for you know Every time you put that into motion um, every day, it is such a wonderful gift to be able to um, get up and and set the day to have a professional career in something that you absolutely adore and love. Um, and the product that comes out of that is so tremendous and the people on the receiving end are the ones that get the greatest gift because we're getting they're getting everything that they possibly can get out of you the best of you um and 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 i i really um commend you for um thank god you didn't go the classical route because i think that um you're a badass at what you do, and um, you know you got me hooked as a fan. And uh, hopefully, we'll get some more people out there to, you know, my I, I like to kind of um, mix up the bag here at Unnormalized Podcast, so people can be exposed to all different kinds of people, all different kinds of talents and skill sets, and um, open up the doors to maybe something trying that you haven't tried before. Um, and I think when people, well, not that I think, I know when people um, see the body of work, you know, after hearing Baron, it's one thing about him talking about all of the experiences and it, it, it makes me even excited just to listen to it, but to see him in action is, is something that is very, very impressive. Um, and he's a bluesy, so full, chill type of guy. Like, the way you play is just, like, so up my alley. Um, and uh, I, I, I've kind of gotten more into that style of music. Um, I don't know if it's because, you know, you get older, you start to have an affinity for things that are more 
you know, classical that have some a body of life that behind it. Um, and I fell into I went out. I'm a vinyl collector, so I went. I go out and buy vinyl records all the time. I like the, the crate loads. Um, right. And some guy was like had some some stuff that I wanted. You know that he's like you got to take the whole thing. So um, bought the whole thing home. There was maybe like. One Daryl Hall and John Oates record in there, a Heart record in there. The the rest of it was like all blues, jazz type of stuff, like Count Basie, like tons of Count Basie records, um, Chuck Mangione, things like that. Um, so I've like really on my downtime, um, you know, because my job is a little stressful. I enjoy just coming home throwing it on and really just like unwinding. There's just something about the whole bluesy jazz R and B movement that I really totally dig. So what you do is something that I, you know, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Baron. Um, and I know you just were in the studio today, right? <laughs> yeah. <I> mean, <laughs> a nice studio in Montclair sound by sound. Sound on Sound, very, very excellent. I, they used to be in New York, Sound on Sound. The owner used to have a studio there. So uh, recording for a friend that's local in Montclair. But I, I played flute and some sax on it. It was a lot of fun, yeah. Awesome. I, I spent a lot of time in the studio, too, not only the road. I've had a lot, vast experience with music. I, I mean, you know, I'm in the studio today. Tomorrow I'm playing in Long Island on a boardwalk with this guy, Killer Joe, with the uh, Arno Hecht, who was from the Uptown Horns that toured with the Stones. I mean, nice. I I like to keep the variety that yeah. way, freelancing. I mean, of course, when you're on tour, you're with that guy. When I was with McIntyre Murphy, or when I, I subbed for Lou Marini and the Blues Brothers Band, I'm, of course, I'm with them. But when I'm home, I like to play with as... I love to play with as many people. I love playing with pe- as many people as I can. Yeah, I love, absolutely. You know I mean? it's, it's like this... It, you know, it's like we're communicating to each other. We're making, I don't know, love or, but you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's very intimate. It's very intimate, of course. Yeah, I love, I love, yeah, I love playing with as many people as I can. It's really, really cool. And uh, it's it's really impressive, too, like how, like, you have such a wide range of of a body of work. I mean, like, from big names to smaller intimate settings, like you said, to Broadway to, you know, theme music and all that kind of stuff. I love how there's such a, you know, you're lending your gift and your talents in so many different facets of the, the entertainment industry um, and successful at what you do. Um, right. and, uh, um, uh, you were mentioning Count Basie. When I lived in Scarsdale, Frank Foster used to live in Scarsdale, who played tenor saxophone for uh, Count Basie. He used to come to my high school and play for us and do our sax socials. And he used to say, try to learn as many styles as you can. And I listened to him. And mm-hmm. that's what I have done. I can play a style like Johnny Hodges from Duke Ellington's band. I, I, I can play the rock sax. I can play RB. I can play Cannonball Adderley type of stuff. I, I mean, I have my own voice, um, which takes a long time, but I, mm. I, I, I kind of like that being able, you know, and part of the, that's been the reason why I've done a lot of studio work in my life, too, because I can play a lot of different styles because, you know, for movie, film or whatever, TV show, they want different things, you know. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it keeps well, life interesting. Yes. Yeah. And it keeps you keeps you working on your craft and 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 you can tell that you put so much work into it. And um, I really appreciate that you take your you took time out of your busy schedule to to come on here and just talk to people about, um, you know, I hope what they take away from this conversation um, with you, Baron, is that when you have a passion, when you have a desire, when you have dreams, um, and I know sometimes that can sound cliche to people like follow your dreams, follow your dreams, but I can't stress to people how important that is. And you, you are the living example that when you 
follow your dreams and you put hard work into making those dreams reality, you can turn that dream or that passion uh, into success and into a profession where you can make a living um, and be happy with with doing that outside of going the normal routes of, you know, being a, a, a doctor or a lawyer or working in social work, you know, like it, it's those things, or even if it is, the, are well, those things. I have to say when I got older, I do teach now. Okay. Too. I, I do mm-hmm. both, but I do both. You see all the performing. Now I, I kind of feel like I needed to give back. Yeah. Some t- I, cause I, yeah, I, I just felt like I, so I do teach like some it kind of, I do teach norm like I teach a uh, jazz lab at a high school and a uh, survey of pop music. But I, I feel like I'm giving back, you know, I also do that, too, you know. Uh, and, um, and and we need you. We need you in that capacity, too, because we need more Baron Raimondis out there. So, you know, the you can then be still into them what they need to do to make it their turn, their dreams um into a reality and seeing somebody you know i always am a i'm a type of person where i'm a a a person where i you know i really and it took it was a skill that i of course learned later in life unfortunately was when someone like yourself is in front of me and they're sharing their experiences and um turning that turning your ears on to really absorbing um, what the people are telling you because the, the they're telling you that because there's there's a reason there's success behind it they're the living example of what you need to do um, and I think nowadays more so than ever um, in a lot of bullshit that we're exposed to nowadays people need to return back to that people need to return back into what they enjoy, passions, and especially our youth. I, I'm, I'm always have been. I have a 17 year old son, but I've always been involved in education. Um, and it's, it really even saddens me that there is a lack of that in our, in our um, school system, in our educational curriculum. Um, that we have lost a lot of that. So I, I really thank you. Baron, for turning that back towards um, your roots, going to school for educa- uh, music education, and bringing that in, keeping that in, into our schools, because I really think that music education is something that we are desperately lacking. Um, and there's a Baron in sitting in one of those classrooms waiting for someone like you to walk in to inspire them because there's not they're not exposed to it as much um on an educational level so um i i really i you know your body of work is impressive but i really commend you for now shifting something that back into education um because like i said uh these youngsters need to see that there's there's hope in and pursuing dreams and 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 uh you know there is a baron out there sitting in that uh-huh. class too, waiting for you to come in and say this is possible and that could be the moment where um like i went into the theater that day and saw alvin ailey and then the very next day saw twyla tharp and my like world opened up to the to the the art form of dance so um i i really i really commend you on all your work um i really appreciate all the time that you spent with me talking today i really enjoyed our conversation getting to um know what 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 how somebody goes from you know even with a family who's in music um with all that came with that and then to follow your path and your journey to right now um and all the impressive stuff that you've done you're i can't 
blow enough smoke up your ass, but you are <laughs> a tremendous, a me- tremendous talent. Um, and I, you have a fan in me now. I am going to be following you. I want everyone to go out there and Baron, give, give our guests your, your, um, your website, your YouTube, whatever you want to throw oh. at them. Okay, uh, my website is saxbaron, S-A-X-B-A-R-O-N dot com. Uh, I'm also on Twitter, saxbaron, and um, I'm on Instagram, I think it's saxbaron too. So, awesome. But, uh, yeah, yeah, yes. And, and, and subscribe to his YouTube cha- channel, Baron Raimondi. Um, you guys need to subscribe to it and follow his journey, look at his body of work. Um, you're going to know what I'm talking about when, when you see him um, doing his thing, um, what passion, joy, and the love of for what you do kind of comes through. It, it's something amazing to witness. I do, before I let you go, Baron, I do ask all of my guests, um, since this is the Unnormalized podcast, what is, give me one thing, that you do now it doesn't have to be with music it could be whatever when we talk about unnormalized what do you do to kind of maybe something out there that you would do to outside of the box to keep you grounded keep you you know especially having a grueling schedule like you do um in the studio performing all that kind of stuff what is something that you do kind of like outside the box to Keep you stable, keep you grounded. Um, I mean, I like to take walks. I don't know if that's outside the box. I, t- I take walks. I like to walk in the in the woods. The, uh, what do I do outside of the box? Um, well, for you, walking would be outside of the box because <laughs> you, in nature, because it's probably something that brings you, returns you back to centered. Um, you need that peace and quiet, that moment of, of connecting back with like nature and all that. Um, so yeah, that is an outside of the box for a musician um, to, you know, feel like they need to do something as simplified, you know, it, it could be, you know, unnormalizes something that is very tailored and specific for everyone. So um, if that works for you, stripping things down, um, to the basics where you can just breathe in the air and be around nature and all that kind of stuff that's that's what you do to keep yourself you know grounded and stable so um well everybody this has been a great show um i really enjoyed myself and again baron thank you so so much for for taking the time and sitting on on this little podcast that could um i really have somebody of your caliber on a small show like this is is much much appreciated so i i greatly appreciate your time thanks for having me no problem and ladies and gentlemen stay tuned for our next episode of unnormalized podcast coming out every tuesday look out for this we'll be streaming on all podcast platforms google podcasts apple Podcasts, stitcher spotify YouTube, you name it. Go check out Baron Raimondi at saxbaron.com. Subscribe to his YouTube channel. Check him out on Twitter and on Instagram. And stay unnormalized.